All right. Good morning, Birmingham. Welcome to the BitBrum Conference. My name is Thomas Hunt from the World Crypto Network. I also do a show called Mad Bitcoins. It's pretty fun. It's like a light and fun way to look at Bitcoin. I started it back in 2013. I uh, just thought there was only kind of a, this kind of NPR, kind of boring talking about Bitcoin. It was very scientific, and I thought we could have something fun with this because this is money for the people. So it's it's going to be fun. So first of all. Uh, how far did people drive to get here? Does anyone live in Birmingham? Didn't drive at all? All right, one guy. Uh, anyone drive like half an hour to an hour? Local people? All right. How about two hours? Two hours? Three hours? Any, anybody take an airplane to get here? I know I took a couple airplanes. Okay, not a lot of airplanes. Uh, so you drove two or three hours or local. And then how long have people been in Bitcoin? Has anyone been in Bitcoin maybe like five years? Oh, that's like a lot. Four years, three Two, anyone just hear about Bitcoin yesterday? No? Okay, so there are some Bitcoiners out there. But I thought we'd go ahead and start at the beginning. In the beginning of time, mankind were broken up into little tribes, mainly having wars and fighting with each other. Then we settled down, started growing some grain. We thought maybe we could have more than just one animal. We'd have an extra animal to sell, maybe another animal. And then we started trading, and maybe we'd trade a piece of meat for a bag of grain. And that worked well for a while, but then maybe you said, your meat is really good. You should give me two bags of your grain. And I said, what about one and a half? And then it seemed like we needed something else other than meat and grain and things to trade. So we came up with this kind of idea of tokens. And at first, we were trading seashells and stones with holes in them. And then you know, the water flew out, and Fred found a bunch of seashells and cornered the market on seashells. And some, suddenly, you, know, you had to pay 20 seashells for a bag of meat. And it just wasn't going to work, because seashells weren't rare enough anymore. And the stone rocks were counterfeited. And then we said, oh, let's use, let's use precious metals. There's not a lot of shiny stuff. So we had gold and silver as our money. And there was even this great country in the beginning, the United States, and they wrote it right in the Constitution that only gold and silver should be used for all debts, public and private. And that worked well for a while. But then we went off that, and we got off the gold standard under Nixon, and we created this thing called fiat. And what it was is, instead of using the actual gold or the actual silver to trade, you'd go to a place and they'd give you a piece of paper that was lighter and easier to carry around than gold and silver. And you could trade that for things. But then, one day, they had a really clever idea. We can make more pieces of paper than we have gold in the bank. Unless they all come to us at the same time, it'll all be fine. So they just kept making more paper and more paper and more paper. And then in the 1970s, they got the great idea Let's just get rid of the gold altogether. We'll just have the paper. And they invented this idea called fiat. And it means let it be done in Latin. It's a government word. And that's what they do now is the government says, we're going to make more money. So Congress for, in the United States, they say, hey, we want to build some more bombers. So they say, OK, let's print a bunch of money, give it to the bomber company, get some more bombers. Great. And everyone else who's holding on to money or is holding on to a house or anything that's denominated in this money suddenly has less and less and less money. So a few years ago, this guy Satoshi Nakamoto came along and he said, we can solve this problem. We can have a new kind of currency that's locked to 21 million units. And no one can ever print any more, ever. And it has a lot of digital signatures, and it has a shared ledger called the blockchain, and all these other things. But it's really about this idea that no one can print any more money ever. So if you have Bitcoin, it's not inflationary currency, like the fiat, where there's constantly more because they're inflating. They're blowing up the bubble. They're making more and more and more, and it's worth less and less and less. It's deflationary money. They're actually printing less of it all the time. And in about... In about May of 2020, we're going to have another halvening. And a halvening is this thing that Satoshi built into the Bitcoin protocol where the difficulty goes up. So the amount of Bitcoin being produced goes down. And it goes down by half about every four years. So imagine if every four years, half of the gold mines just shut down. They're not producing gold anymore. And the Bitcoin reward has been much like this so far. It started out at 50. It went to 25. 
I think it's 12 and a half now, and then next time it'll go to six and a quarter, and then three, and then less than one. So there's less Bitcoin being made all the time. So now if people hold money, it might actually go up in value because there's less and less of it around. Also, all of the governments can no longer print money. So if they want to go to war and they want to print a bunch of bombers, and then once you have bombers, you pretty much have to use bombers, right? Otherwise, you just wasted your money. And you can leave them lying around, but then you got to buy more bombers and new bombers and better bombers. And you should use them, right? I mean, you paid for them. And, that's what they're, and your neighbors just bought a bunch of bombers, too. Now the government can't do that anymore. They can't borrow money. They can't print money. So that's good on one hand. No more wars, no more bombers. But on the other hand, if you think about disaster relief, like they have a hurricane and Bruce Springsteen gets up on their TV and says, you have to donate now. We're going to help the people that had their lives ruined by the hurricane. And, you know, we just print a bunch of money and we give it to them. We can't do that anymore either. So if you donate to the hurricane, we're going to build new houses. If you don't, we're not going to do it. But I thought this was a pretty great idea when I read about it uh, back when Bitcoin first came out. But then we'd had a lot of great ideas like this. We had uh, e-gold, and we had all these other money systems, that were liberty dollars, that were all centralized. And eventually, the government showed up and knocked on the door of the person that was printing the money and said, hey, we're shutting you down. It's over. But with Bitcoin, it's decentralized. The ledger is held in everyone's computer all over the world, so you just there's not enough doors to knock on. There's not enough government agents. They can't shut them all down at the same time. Somebody somewhere is going to have a copy of the ledger. And I thought this was really clever, but it was command line, and it was hard to use, and uh, a lot of these projects had failed before in the past. So like everybody else, when I first found Bitcoin, I put it in the back of my head. And I said, that's nonsense. I'll, I'll look at it a few years from now. Didn't buy any, of course. It was very difficult to buy. I probably would have lost them, left them on an exchange. Or if they doubled in price, I would have sold them right away and thought I was really smart. But a few years later, in 2013, in April, there was this event in Cyprus where Cyprus, the government, they figured out there's a lot of foreign drug money in our banks. And we control those banks. We're the government. So what they did is they froze everyone's account. They didn't use ICE or anything. It's not a scientific term. It's a legal term. They just called up the bank and said, hey, freeze the accounts. The bank said, OK. So everybody's accounts were frozen in Cyprus. And the people of Cyprus had no way to get their money. They lined up at the ATMs. And every day, the ATM would give them a Cyprus equivalent of $100, not a lot of money. Their accounts were frozen. And what they're going to do is they're going to give them a haircut. And again, another legal term, a financial term, a haircut is 10% off the top. Right? Just 10% of your money is gone because you were holding it in a bank in Cyprus and you trusted the bank, you trusted the government, you put a lot of trust in other people. And for your reward for your trust, you're going to lose 10% off the top. So I, I thought about this and I thought, what if the people of Cyprus had Bitcoin? What if the people of Cyprus could move their money into this non-government, distributed digital currency? There's less and less of it all the time. Nobody has the ability to print it anywhere ever. And I think a lot of other people thought about this, too. And it wasn't quite so much that Cyprus had Bitcoin in 2013, because nobody had Bitcoin in 2013. It's this idea that Cyprus could have Bitcoin. And this idea drove the price of Bitcoin up to $300. And again, I'm the dumbest person in the world. I didn't buy any. I didn't have any. It went to 300 I could have gotten it at a dollar, all those things. But that didn't matter. It mattered more that we suddenly had a safety valve. We had an escape. We had potential. So from then on, I was like, well, this Bitcoin thing's awesome. I was unemployed. I put the little money I had in. And after that, what do you do? What I did is the most obvious and simple thing is I got a mad hatter hat and crazy goggles and a green screen background and started doing the daily news of fun Bitcoin, trying to make it accessible, not science, not math, fun. It's money, and it's the internet, and it's fun, and it's like email. And you don't, you know, you didn't have anybody to email in 1995, but if you learned how to use it, just a few years later, suddenly, everybody was using email. And I thought the same thing's going to be true of Bitcoin. Nobody knows how to use it right now, but in a few years, everybody's going to be using it. And all I really need to do is learn how to use it and teach my friends how to use it, and maybe teach the internet how to use it. 
So over the next two years, I made 600 daily episodes of Mad Bitcoins, and I was doing it every day and just cranking them out because if you do something every day, the internet will respect you. They see you have a work ethic. They're like, I don't like him, but he keeps coming back every day, and the price keeps going up, and that seems good, and you know, I didn't believe him at this, and I didn't believe him at that, but then it went to that, and I bought some, and now it's worth more, and then it's worth less, and then maybe more. But so they stuck with it. And then around 2014, I, um, we were you know, talking to my brother, and he's like, yeah, you're the only one out there talking about Bitcoin. You and the Let's Talk Bitcoin guys, that's it. We need other people to talk about Bitcoin, people who aren't you, right? So we started the World Crypto Network, and we started talking to people all over the world and on the internet, anyone who wanted to volunteer and show up and, and you know, use their time to help paint Tom Sawyer's fence uh, could come in and talk about Bitcoin, and we'd share, share the audience with them, the, the people that we'd found who also wanted to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, so we kept working on that for a couple of years. We made like a few thousand videos on the World Crypto Network. Uh, we did a weekly show called The Bitcoin Group, kind of a roundtable discussion, did about 200 of those, uh, did a little bit of traveling, did some live streams at conferences, and just tried to spread the word about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin just kept growing, and the community got bigger, and then they invented all these altcoins and all these other coins, and, and they came up and down and up and down, and all that happened. And now we're here in Birmingham to learn about Bitcoin. So that's what's been happening. Uh, I've been on another little mad tour recently. I went to the HCPP hacker convention in Prague. It was really great. A lot of uh, people in masks protecting their privacy, talking about anonymity and security and mixing their wallets and all these complex topics. Uh, then I went to Transylvania, to the Transylvania crypto conference in Romania, and all these people with high collars and pointy teeth, and uh, they looked a little sketchy, and we went to a salt mine, and I don't know what happened there, but it was deep underground in Romania, and uh, that was fun, too, and we had a lot of speakers, and uh, then I came up here, did uh, about a week in Scotland and a week in, week in Ireland, so got to visit all my famous authors, and Robert Louis Stevenson, and Oscar Wilde, and James Joyce is pretty interesting, too, but his museum was dead empty. They're telling me how important Ulysses is, but I'm the only one there. So oh, I guess it's really important, but it was another time. It was a Victorian time. But we did all that, and now we're here in Birmingham to learn about Bitcoin. And we're going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Greg Walker is going to talk about what is blockchain anyway. Come on down, Greg. Hello. Yeah, all good. How's that sounding? Pretty good. Not too bad. Yeah, keep going. All hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. All right, wicked. Um, my name is Greg. Um, I've been interested in Bitcoin for about um, four or five years now. Um, I'm mostly a sort of computer programmer. Um, found Bitcoin, found it really interesting. First used it, I thought, wow, this is impressive. Um, why isn't everyone using this? Um, so I wanted to find out how does this work. So um, I found out, well, I tried to find out how it worked. And um, I fancy myself as a bit of a teacher, so I like trying to explain how it works. So I'm currently working on a website called uh, Learn Me a Bitcoin, which is basically trying to explain how Bitcoin works in really simple terms so everyone can understand it. So um, that's why I'm here today now, is to give a presentation on how blockchain works. So if you ever heard the word term blockchain or blockchain technology, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a very good understanding of how it all works. Right, so before I actually get on to um, how blockchain works, I'll do a quick recap of what Bitcoin is. So this might be a bit of a simple introduction for a lot of you, if you're quite technical or understand how Bitcoin works, this will be um, very much a recap uh, from then. I'll go on to some uh, blockchain basics. What is the blockchain? Where does it come from? Um, quick primer on blockchain. And then from there, I'll go on to some more technical stuff, for how blockchains are built, how they evolve, and how they, how they grow. And that's called uh, chain reorganizations. Big word, but we'll come to it in a minute. It'll make sense shortly. From there, you might have heard of a 51% attack. 
It's quite interesting, so I'll cover that as well. Um, and so this is basically all of the main uh, mechanics of how blockchain works. Um, so if you understand all that, then you'll understand how blockchain works. But then to top it off at the end, I'll cover two terms called uh, hard forks and also soft forks, because they're kind of related to what, how blockchains work as well. Okay, good. Right, I think I've got about half an hour, so I might just spin through this quite quickly. Things would take about 45 minutes last time I did it, but uh, I'll give it a whirl. Right, so first of all, recap. What is Bitcoin? Very quick introduction to what Bitcoin is. Um, Bitcoin is just a computer program. So if you've got a computer, you can download, download Bitcoin on your computer and run it, and that is Bitcoin running on your computer. But it doesn't just run on your computer. There are lots of people all over the world with computers downloading the program and running it as well. And all of those computers connect together to create a network of computers all running the same program. And that is basically Bitcoin. Um, each of those uh, computers, we'll call them nodes from here on out, um, has what's called a memory pool. I'll cover that in a minute, just some temporary memory, temporary storage. And it also has this file called the blockchain. And that file is the main file that all these computers on the network are sharing. And that's what we all want to share and keep a copy of. Um, so how do you uh, use Bitcoin then? Um, well, Bitcoin is a currency. So when you want to use Bitcoin, you create a transaction. And a transaction is ultimately just a line of data um, describing the movement of Bitcoins from one account to another. That's all a transaction is. And you can encode that into a single line of data. So when you want to make that transaction, move the Bitcoins from one place to another, um, you'll insert that transaction into one of the nodes on the network. And then that node will store it in its temporary memory. So we have temporary memory, the memory pool, and also permanent memory, the blockchain. So first of all, it gets stored in temporary memory. From there, that, uh, tran that transaction gets propagated from node to node um, until every single node on the network has a copy of that transaction in their memory pool. Okay? Uh, from there, you want to get that transaction onto the blockchain. So this memory pool, temporary memory, this transaction could disappear after a few days, but really you want it to get stored in, temporary, in permanent memory, permanent storage in the blockchain. How does that happen? Well, that's the process of mining. So we, have a, uh, we start with create what's called a candidate block. So if you're a miner now, this is a node, any node can become a miner, and they can basically become a miner to try and get the transactions on the memory pool onto the blockchain. First thing they do, you create, create what's called a candidate block. And this candidate block is just a container for transactions that you want to add onto the blockchain. Just a block. It's like a container for transactions. So as a miner, what I'll do, they go into their memory pool, create a candidate block, and fill it with transactions from their memory pool. So this is ready now to go onto the blockchain, if they can get it onto there. So each of these nodes on the network, if they want to mine, they can all do this independently. Get the transactions from their memory pools onto the blockchain. So they're all doing this independently. This is the process of mining. Now, mining takes a lot of energy and processing power, and it can't be faked or forged. So every single, these no every single one of these nodes now are using their energy to try and get this block onto the blockchain. I'm not going to explain how this works. I'm just going to say that it takes energy, and it's basically like a random lottery, and it's unpredictable, and we don't know which one of these nodes is going to be able to add their block onto the blockchain. Okay, so I've sort of skimmed past that, how mining works. But it takes energy, and it's like a lottery, and unpredictable. So let's say uh, this node here, they were the first one to mine their block onto, this, onto the blockchain. What they'll do, they'll propagate this block to all the nodes they're connected to as well, like so. Each of the, one of these nodes will go, okay, wait there, there's a new block. They'll stop the block they're working on, add this block that's been mined, because they can prove it's been mined, they can validate it, add it onto their blockchain, like so. And this block makes way across the whole entire network until everyone has a copy um, of this latest block and everyone updates their blockchain. So now we have four blocks on the blockchain. Um, so yeah, that's how uh, mining works. But the question is why? Why would we have this mining system? Why not just when we make a transaction, we insert it into the network? Why hold it into the memory pool first? Why not just put it straight into the blockchain? Well, there was a problem with doing this, the way networks work. And this is what basically Bitcoin solved. This is the problem that Bitcoin solved. Um, because what you can do you can actually create two, two transactions at the very same time. So whereas um, with this first transaction, I can be sending my one Bitcoin to you, but then in another transaction, I can be sending, I can make another transaction at the same time, send that same Bitcoin to you. And what I'll do, this is called a double spend, I will insert both those transactions into different parts of the network. And you can't stop me from doing this. 
and, there were no, and so what would happen from there is each of these nodes would accept those transactions. Both of those transactions would be relaying across the network. Um, this node, you know, after it receives this A transaction, it'll be wait there. Those Bitcoins already been spent. That's an invalid transaction. So that kind of works. Then you have this problem now where the network is split about which one of these two transactions belongs on the blockchain or which one of these two transactions is the correct one. You know, because the way that data travels across the, net, across the network, you can't solve this. We know that A was first, but how can we get all these computers on the network to independently um, verify or come to an agreement about which one was actually first? It's hard to say. These think B was first, others think A, A was first, and they're both correct. So how do we solve this? For Bitcoin to work, we need a consistent history of transactions, so only one of these two can make it onto the blockchain. So that's why we have mining, because each of these nodes, they'll go into their memory pool and create a block for the transactions they've got in their memory pool. And then, after about 10 minutes, because mining takes about 10 minutes on average, um, one of those nodes will mine their block, and when they've done that, they'll send that block out because they, to other nodes. This is like a, a mine block, which is good. Um, these nodes will see that block, add it to the chain, get rid of the one they're working on. That A transaction they'll kick out. This is like the truth, you know. Anything that gets mined on the blockchain is correct. Anything that's not on the blockchain just gets removed. So there we are. Now, thanks to this system of mining, we can get all these computers on the network to agree on the same history of transactions in the blockchain. So that's why we have mining. It solves this problem of computers on a network being able to agree on the same set of data eventually. So that really is what the, the Bitcoin solves, the, the invention of Bitcoin. Anyway, that's a recap. Um, also, why is this called blockchain? It's just blocks of transactions, why is it called blockchain? Basically, each one of these blocks, when you mine one, they build on top of an existing block on the blockchain. They specify which one they want to build on top of. So they're connected together. So have a chain of blocks like so, or simplify it, a blockchain. That's why it's called blockchain. But ultimately, it's just a one big file of transactions. That's what it is practically, but when it comes to the mechanics of it, blockchain describes the mechanics of how it works. So that's what I'm going to explain today, eventually. So that is basically a very quick recap of what Bitcoin is and what the problem, the problem is that it solves. So now, introduction, a bit of blockchain basics. Um, the cool thing about Bitcoin, anyone can join it. It's not a special group of people. Anyone with a computer can download the program and run it. So, got a computer, download the program. Uh, when you run the program, it'll connect to other nodes on the network. And then they will start sending you all the blocks they've got, the longest chain of blocks they've got. So, um, anyone can get a copy of the blockchain with all the transactions in it. And the blockchain is currently quite large. It's about 225 gigabytes, so it can take a few days for it to fully download. This is called the initial block uh, blockchain download. It can take a while. But it's got all the transactions that have ever taken place since 2009 in it, so it's not too bad. Um, similarly, <laughs> if you take your computer offline um, and other nodes are mining blocks like so, so the network's getting ahead of you, the blockchain's getting longer while you're offline, that's cool. Um, what will happen when you connect again? Um, you'll tell the node you're connected to, OK, I've got this many blocks. They'll say, I've got this many blocks. Your node will say, OK, give me these. So all the other nodes will help you to keep up to date with the blockchain when you join back, when you connect back to the internet. So in this way, you have you know, a file that's constantly working to replicate itself on as many computers as possible. Why? What's the benefit of this? Um, why have this same file replicated over multiple computers? It'd be a lot simpler just to have one computer in the middle, almost like a bank. Um, but the problem with this is it's what's called centralized. So if you were a government or a bank and you saw Bitcoin coming up and you had this all payment processing system, digital currency, it's like, oh, we don't want that. We want to control the flow of money. We don't want anyone else sending money without us knowing about it. All you have to do is take out that one node. So I think, I don't know much about the original, all the currencies, digital currencies were created, but one was called DigiCash. And I think it works a bit similar to this. So we had like a centralized ledger or centralized point of control. So what happens is, you take out the one node, the whole network dies. So it's vulnerable. And I think governments would like to do that if they could. Um, so 
what you can do, if you don't want to make this to be fragile or vulnerable, you want to replicate this blockchain on as many computers as possible. So now it's decentralized or distributed. So if, you, if you're a government looking at this, okay, we want, I want to stop this from working anymore. How can we cut this out? Well, you need to take out all of the computers on the network doing the, running this program to be able to take it down. So, like so. But if you can't take them all out and there's still some left, they can be the seed for the blockchain to replicate it over the computers again. So it's constantly working to replicate itself and it's hard to take down. So that's why Bitcoin uses this sort of replicating system of the blockchain over multiple computers. Uh, so there we are. So that's introduction to blockchain and why we use it. Now it's going to get a little bit more technical. There's only two technical sections now, um, but it's not too hard. But it will cover how these blockchains work. First thing is chain reorganizations. So a good question to ask now. We did this thing earlier. We inserted two transactions into the network at the same time. What happens if two miners, if it's unpredictable, what if two miners mine a block at the very same time? Well, that can happen, and that's expected, but it can be resolved. So, for example, let's say this node here and this node here both mine a block at the exact same time. Both of these blocks will start propagating the network, and um, the nodes will add the first block they receive to the top of their chain. But instead of rejecting the second block, they will keep it on the side just in case. So here we are, like so. So now we have this situation where the nodes, again, are in disagreement about what the blockchain should look like. These nodes think the purple block should be at the top, and these nodes here <coughs> think the green block should be at the top. So how do we resolve that? Well, uh, that gets resolved when the next block gets mined. So um, let's say this miner here, they are going to be mining on top of the block, first block they receive. This is the top block on their chain. They want to build on top of that one. So let's say they mine a block on top of there. They will add it onto their chain like so. Send that block around the network, here and here like so. These nodes are all cool with it, that's fine. You know, We always thought this was the longest chain, the correct chain of blocks. This builds on top of it, that's fine. These nodes here, they'll go, oh, wait there. Um, this block we received builds on that second block and creates a new longest chain. So what they'll do, all nodes always adopt the longest known chain of blocks, the one that has the most energy put into building it. So even though this was their original longest chain, they've received a new longest chain. And uh, what they'll do, they'll do what's called a chain reorganization to adopt this new longest chain of blocks. And every single node will do that independently to adopt the longest chain, because the longest chain always wins. So there we are. Could have been any one of these two blocks, doesn't matter which one. Could have been these nodes over here, building on the green one, Could, but it ended up being the purple one. That one became the new longest chain, and everyone adopted it, and now everyone is on the same page. So this longest chain system allows all nodes or computers on the network to eventually agree on what the blockchain should look like. Um, this block here, this green one, um, ends up, when it gets pushed out, it becomes uh, deactivated. So this block is now deactivated and these blocks become activated. So they are, this is the valid or the correct version of transactions in the blockchain. So what happens to this orphan block? So you might have had this block, this green block at the top of your chain, but then a new block comes in, the org happens, and then this old block gets shifted out, deactivated. It's not valid anymore. What happens to the transactions in it? Um, well, to be honest, if two blocks get mined at the same time, both of those nodes are probably going to have similar transactions in their memory pools, but they might be a little bit different. So let's say this green block had one extra transaction in it that this purple one didn't. Um, basically, that transaction isn't valid, valid anymore. It doesn't count. It's like it never happened, um, which isn't great. Um, but what will happen is your node will recycle that back into the memory pool and send it back out across the network for the chance to get mined back into the blockchain again. So anything in the trans any transactions in the orphan box get recycled back to get mined on again. But it does mean that because of this way that two blocks can get mined at the same time, that if you see your transaction get mined into a block, there is a chance, an outside chance, that it can get reorged out and have to get mined back in again. 
Um, it happens really. Um, I've looked, if you download the program, you can ask it questions. And I've looked at my node, and it seems to be happening about once a month, I think, where my node receives a block and then shifts out, and the transactions have to get recycled back in again. So it's quite rare. Um, so it's not very common. Um, I haven't got it set up here. But yeah, it's um, unlikely. It does happen, but it's unlikely. But just something to be aware of that does happen. If you see a transaction get block, transaction get mined into a block, you know, there's a chance that some of the top blocks in the chain could get shifted back out. So how many confirmations should you wait for? It's a good question. If you people were talking about confirmations when you make a transaction, you want to wait for a few confirmations. Why? Well, principally because you know, these reorgs can happen if two blocks get mined at the same time. But I've never seen it in looking at my node for the last two or three years, uh, a reorg that was longer than two blocks deep. So you could have two blocks mined at the same time, then another two, then another two. So you could have quite large reorgs at the top of the chain. Um, I've never seen one deeper than one block, just the top block being reorged. So to avoid, well, it's not 100%, but I've never seen it happen. If your transaction was two blocks down in the chain, um, it's probably not going to get reorged out. Can't promise it won't, but I've never seen it happen. Right, that's chain reorganizations. That's probably the most complex part. Um, leads me on to now something called 51% uh, attacks. You've probably all about, heard about this. Um, so I'll explain how they work and why they work. So you might have noticed that I said that nodes always adopt the longest chain of blocks. So that does mean that you could always rewrite blocks in the blockchain or undo transactions that have already been mined into the blockchain. That's possible. For example, um, let's say I made a transaction here to buy a car, um, and that gets mined into the blockchain. The person I bought it from gives me the car, I drive off, I drive home, I set up my miner, and I start building a longer chain of blocks. Because what I want to do, I want to undo this transaction make it invalid like it never happened, like I never sent those Bitcoins to that person. So if I turn my miner on, build a new longest chain, and then I send that chain of blocks out to all the other nodes on the network, they'll see, okay, wait there, yeah, this is the longest chain. Wicked, um, we'll adopt this, we'll do a reorg, and deactivate those blocks in the old block longest chain. So you can actually undo transactions that have been mined um, through mining. But there's a problem with this. I've made that sound very simple. It's not as simple as that, because while I'm home mining from this block here to build a new longest chain, all of the other nodes on the network or miners on the network are incentivized to build on top of the current longest chain. So I've got my little miner at home mining here using energy, but the whole combined energy of the network is building on top of this chain. So while I'm building away, the, node, the other nodes on the network, miners on the network, are building a chain faster than I, can, than I can. So I'll never be able to outpace the combined effort of all the other miners on the network. So that's what protects this block from being taken out of the chain. That makes some sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the solution to that is me being belligerent, not giving up. Uh, I'll just build a much bigger miner. A miner where I have more processing power than all of the other miners on the network combined. Because if I can do that, I can outrun the other miners to build a new longest chain. And when I do, I'll just send that into the network, and they'll adopt it, and then they'll all jump onto that longest chain and start building that with me. So all I need to do to rewrite the blockchain is build a big enough miner with enough energy to be able to mine blocks faster than every other miner combined. So what you need is a majority of processing power uh, which is why this is called a majority attack. Um, problem with that is it's going to cost you a lot, a lot of money to be able to get the hardware to do that. And no one has ever actually been able to do this in Bitcoin so far because all of the miners on the network are working together to keep building this longest chain that no one has ever actually built, intentionally built a chain longer to undo transactions. So all miners are incentivized to build on top of this chain. Um, and so it's never happened before. And that's what protects your transactions in the chain. from. So when they're in there, they're not going to be kicked out. So how many confirmations should you wait for to avoid this? Well, like I said, it's never happened before.
but let's say you're worried, you, you, you bought a, a five pound sandwich from somewhere and you're worried that uh, someone wants to reverse it. Um, a point I should mention is, if you've got a majority of the mining power, 50% or more, you can definitely rewrite as many blocks as you want. It'll take time. If you've got more mining power, you'll eventually outpace all the other miners combined. Um, but you can still have a chance of rewriting blocks in the chain if you have less than 50%. So if you had 40% uh, mining power, I mean, you need to get lucky. You need to be able to mine blocks, you know, get lucky and uh, to outpace the other miners. But if you have 40%, you know, you'll have that much chance, just over you know, about 70 to 70% of rearranging the top block. But basically what I'm trying to say is that the more power you have, the more chance you have of doing it, but the less power you have, the less chance you have. But also, the further a block gets down into the blockchain, the harder and harder it becomes to rewrite the blocks in the chain. So basically what I'm trying to say here is the topmost blocks in the chain are most vulnerable, but I mean, these are still quite small percentages, like so. Um, a rule or a recommendation that gets mentioned a lot is six confirmations. Not entirely sure why. I think it was gleaned from the white paper somewhere. I, I don't know why it's six confirmations, but these are percentage chances based on how much an individual miner did, did have um, to rewrite a block, your transaction, when it gets this far down in the chain. 46% if they got 40% control, 10%, 7%. So it gets you know, exponentially harder the less control you have. But um, ultimately, if you were to buy a house, I would just wait a day wait for it to go all the way down, you know, or like, depends how much um, control the miners have. Um, I got a nice little GIF, because GIFs are always nice. Uh, that's working. So this just shows the um, distribution of the miners in Bitcoin. So this is, what, this is 2012, I don't know if you can see it. Um, these are all the miners. You don't really want to see any of them getting over 50%. See Ghash there back in 2014, 2015 came close to getting more than 50%. But the more distributed and diverse this is, the better it is for Bitcoin. So this takes up to about last month. So we can see that some of these have got you know about 16% at the moment. So if they really wanted to attack Bitcoin, their chances are you know less than this for rearranging these blocks here. But well, that's assuming that someone's going to put the effort in to try and rewrite your transaction, like a network scale attack to undo a transaction you've made. It's a bit unlikely. Um, okay, so there we are. Right, that's all the technical stuff done. That's basically how blockchain works. If you understand all of that, hopefully, mostly, um, you'll now know what someone says, what someone means when they say the word blockchain or blockchain te technology. Right, um, that's the most important part. Two things I'm going to run through quite quickly is hard forks and soft forks. Um, right, so that's blockchain. Quickly, how do you make a change to um, the Bitcoin software? You have a network of computers working in, uh, independently. If you want to change the software in some way, how can you do that? For example, let's say we don't have one megabyte blocks anymore, because that's a rule that everyone agrees on. You want to make a blocks that can hold more transactions, say 10 megabytes. How can we do that? Well, if you were to just upgrade your node to say, okay, I'm building 10 megabyte blocks from now on, um, you can do that, you can build that block, add it to your chain. When it comes to sending that block to other nodes on the network, they're just gonna reject it because their software is, has rules built in saying, no, that's too big, we only accept one megabyte blocks. So the solution to that is just to get everyone on the network to upgrade their computers to now accept 10 megabyte blocks. Easy enough. Um, and so when you make that 10 megabyte block, they all accept it, that's fine. The problem is though, what if someone doesn't get the memo, doesn't get the message to upgrade? Um, they're just gonna get left behind. So if you're running like a shop and you're running your own node, processing transactions, um, your shop is gonna get left behind. So the network is building blocks, building the longest chain, you're sat there going, where are all these transactions? What's going on? Why am I not getting the transactions? So this isn't ideal, to make everyone upgrade to keep on board with the same chain. 
even bigger problem is what if not some people, someone just doesn't forget. They actually, some nodes on the network disagree with the changes. They think, oh wait, they're 10 megabyte blocks. That's bad for Bitcoin because no one can hold that much data on their computers. So we'll lose nodes and Bitcoin will become more centralized. This was a debate that happened about two or three years ago. Um, 10 megabyte blocks does allow you to process more transactions, but it does at the cost of losing this sort of decentralized um, network, which is what Bitcoin was designed to be. Um, so what happened is, let's say half the nodes disagree, it's a contentious uh, change. So people go, wait, I'm not grading. Other nodes upgrade. So what happened is, the red nodes, they'll be building their 10 megabyte blocks, but these other nodes, they'll continue building the old blocks. And these red nodes won't accept the Black nodes won't accept the red blocks because they're too big, and eventually the transaction histories will change, and these red nodes won't accept the old gray blocks that these blocks are, nodes are building. So what you have is basically you'll have two different um, blockchains, really. You'll have nodes on this side building this red chain, and nodes on this side building this old gray chain. So you have what's called a, a fork in the chain. So basically you sort of split Bitcoin down the middle, and you have sort of two divergent transaction histories, like Bitcoin Classic and well, big, old Bitcoin, new Bitcoin, um, which would be terrible for Bitcoin because you just split the currency down the middle and it would be quite disastrous because what do you accept, what don't you accept, and it's just not good for Bitcoin. Um, sad face. So uh, in Bitcoin, um, the developers, um, at all costs, they want to avoid any changes that could result in a hard fork like this that forces everyone to upgrade, which is nice, but it also causes a problem where you're like, well, how do you upgrade then? You know, if you want to make changes to the software, I'm going to have to get everyone on board, but we don't want to do that. How can you actually change the software? So Bitcoin can be quite slow moving in this way, which is good because it keeps everyone on board on the same, using the same software, but it does make it difficult to change and upgrade. So how can we make changes to the Bitcoin software? There's a better way. Uh, and this is what you call a soft fork. So, what is a soft fork? You might have heard these terms before. Hopefully, this is shining a light on it. The problem with the hard fork was we made an adjustment that old nodes won't accept because the new blocks are incompatible with the old rules. But with a soft fork, what you do is you create a new type of block, but you sort of constrict the rules. You make it more strict. So, whereas before we made incompatible blocks compatible, now we are restricting what blocks can be added onto the chain. So what does that mean? For example, so like here, I, instead of making a 10 megabyte block, which is before illegal, we're now making, we're saying, okay, now we only accept blocks that are 0.5 megabytes in size. This is just another illustration. This has never happened, but it's just to illustrate the difference between a soft fork and a hard fork. So these green blocks are compatible. So to make this work, Oh, so if a node updates and they make a green block, they can just send it to other nodes and they will um, accept it, no problem at all, because it's still within the rules. It's less than one megabyte. That's cool. So to make this work, to make a change and get everyone on board, you just need to have a uh, majority of the nodes or the miners upgrade into this new software. And then this will make everyone come on board. Because the old nodes, the black nodes here, they can still continue building their old chain, if you've got a majority of the miners building these new blocks, they're going to build that chain longer, uh, a longer chain faster. So because these nodes will also be able to accept these green blocks, they will constantly be adopting this new chain. So by having the majority building the longest chain, it constantly forces all the other nodes to come on board with them. So they can keep building their old blockchain, but it's never going to be as long as the blockchain that these green nodes are building. So they've upgraded their software, um, these nodes accept the blocks and the transactions, they'll stay on board, and like so. Problem is, if you don't get a majority, if uh, not a majority of nodes um, accept the, um, are mining the new blocks, um, you will have a fork then, because these green nodes have decided we don't accept these gold grey blocks, um, and this is the longest chain. So, you know, this is, they're saying this is the longest chain. They're saying, okay, we don't accept that, so we have a fork again like before. So that's why we want to make sure that when you make a soft fork and change to the software, that you have a majority of the miners on board to force everyone or encourage everyone to be on the, to stay on the same chain. Smiley face. 
Um, so all changes that have been made to Bitcoin in the past have been do, done through a soft fork. I don't, there's not been any changes that have been made through a hard fork. I think a hard fork will be reserved for some really critical things that break um, that you need to desperately make a change quickly to keep Bitcoin running. But for improvements and upgrades, um, ideally the change is going to be made through um, soft forks. So I don't know how technically you all are, um, but um, some examples of soft forks happened in the past. Um, P2SH changed the way blocks on transactions work. Um, made it more convenient for the sender. But most famously, recently, in recent history, was segregated witness, um, fixed transaction malleability, um, and allowed for easier upgrades in the future. That was quite contentious, because this got all wrapped up in the whole 10 megabyte um, bigger blocks debate. Um, but it was for the best um, to have this done this way. So we've got segregated witness now, which facilitates things like lightning. Um, future um, snore signatures, which will make it more efficient to make signatures and store them on the blockchain, um, and taproot and things like that. But I've already gone quite far technical with this now, so I'm going to not go into that. Yes, go on. I'm pretty sure it's a soft fork. A soft fork, yep. Um, so, summary. Oh, finally, we got there in the end. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, just to recap everything one more time for good measure. Um, nodes on the network, they mine blocks, send them to other nodes, like so, and that's how the blockchain gets built. Um, you can get two blocks mined at the same time, that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, you'll have a temporary disagreement, but that'll get resolved when the next block is mined, because nodes always adopt the longest chain, and they'll do a chain, reorgani chain reorganization to adopt it. So that keeps everyone, all nodes on the network, computers on the network, agreeing on what the transaction history should look like. Um, then those transactions in your often block will get mined back in, sent back into the memory pool, hopefully get mined back onto the chain. Um, how many confirmations do you work for? Uh, one confirmation, the majority of the time, is going to be enough. I think I've looked at my node and it's like a one, four, one in 4,000 chance that a, the, if your transaction gets mined in the top block, it's going to get reorged out and have to get mined back in again. So one block is probably going to be fine. Extra sure, two confirmations. Um, beyond that, you're sort of trying to protect yourself against a network scale attack from someone trying to steal your Bitcoins. Um, so six confirmations was a old, popular number, but I think two will be fine. But, you know, up to you. That's just me, pre my preference. Um, lastly, blockchain explorers. Interestingly, if you ever do a blockchain explorer to find your transaction, see where it is, um, what that blockchain explorer is doing is just showing you that their blockchain so there's no such thing as the blockchain. Everyone has their own copy of the blockchain, and they can be different at any time, any point in time. So when you're looking at a blockchain explorer, you're seeing just their copy of the blockchain. They're generally going to be the same, but just out of interest, you know, you're looking at their blockchain, and you're trusting them to show you what the transactions look like. Also, there's another really cool blockchain explorer called uh, Learn Me a Bitcoin. I would highly recommend it. It's not a very snazzy, but it works like a charm. Everyone, everyone to find a transaction on a block, have a look. But if you want to be completely independent and not have to trust any other um, nodes or services, just run Bitcoin and you can use that and query it to find out and validate your own transaction, verify them and accept your own payments without having to trust anyone else. And that is in the spirit of Bitcoin to do that. But it's up to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Greg. My website is Learn Me A Bitcoin. Um, I've written up these articles on my website. Have a look on there. Type in the search bar, chain reorganizations if you get really bored. Very rainy day. Um, lastly, um, my Twitter is this memorable string of random letters and numbers. Quick explanation, I was doing physics at the time, um, doing inertia, thought that would be a really cool username. Couldn't have that, someone else obviously chose it, obviously a very popular one. So I spelt it phonetically, but then obviously someone else chose a phonetic version, so I stuck a three in instead. So that's how we got there in the end, so I uh, might want to take a picture of that. But um, I'm currently doing um, presentations in Sheffield. Um, Bitcoin Sheffield, so if you want to come make the drive up from Birmingham or wherever you are, um, please do. Um, I'm doing presentations like this, very simple, visual explanation of how it works. So thank you very much.